ask you a uh, kind of a technical question. Um, I've done these sorts of like uh, talks, lectures, you know, or not lectures, but, uh, you know, guest appearances, stuff like this in a couple of different settings. Um, are you, do you do like editing? So like if I have a, if I'm kind of uh, stumped, I want to take a minute, can I just talk to you and be like, can we take, uh, take a second? At, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. Or is this like a live, not going to be edited in any sort no, of way? I can I can absolutely cut if we get to like a, a thing like we're stuttering or something and kind of like losing okay. momentum. I can cut around that. I can put up okay. any images that you want to put up, um, you know, maps and and things of that sort. If uh, okay. if we start getting into like, I I try to let the conversation go in the direction that it's going to go. So if we start getting into right. like, you know, deep in theoretical stuff, I can like put some explanations on screen of like kind of con to contextualize what we're talking about. Um, right. You know, deal with vocabulary, that kind of thing. Uh, because I, I do want to make this as accessible as possible and we can end up yeah. getting into like grad school talk uh, if, we're, yeah. not, if yeah. we're not careful. Um, but just like yeah. to outline um, uh, what I want to go over today. Um, okay. Uh, just kind of talk about the poverty point phenomenon, like the traditional like view of it that that we've had previous to the last couple of years, and then uh, start discussing your work at Jake Town and how that's kind of injecting some more like subtle nuance to this whole discussion of like um, looking over your 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 dissertation uh, since last night. And like, I, I'm really excited about this dissertation, by the way, it's it's written really, really well. And it like it's it's like so theoretically nuanced. I'm, I'm really excited about it. Um, Thank you. Yeah, the uh, but but like getting into like the um the cultural type like these cultural packages and how that kind of smears our resolution and understanding of these these processes that are really much more interactions between communities rather than one community spreading across a landscape yeah. um and then i've got a few questions from uh subscribers that if we don't happen to uh, cover those things in the course of the conversation. Hopefully we'll have time to, to answer those more directly. Um, sure. That'll sound good. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds great. Cool. So, but before we get into all that, I want to kind of like get an introduction to you um, kind of how, how you found your way to archeology, span what your like niche within the archeological world is like what, what it is you do uh, and kind of how do you find yourself there? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm an anthropological archaeologist. Uh, I recently um, graduated from uh, Washington University in St. Louis, where I did my PhD. Uh, and now I'm an assistant professor at Appalachian State University in North Carolina. Um, methodologically, I, I use uh, I use a lot of methods from geoarchaeology, right? Um, and for those of uh, those listening that may have never heard uh, that term, it's just what it sounds like. It's using methods and concepts from the earth sciences and applying them to archaeological problems. So um, a lot of uh, analytical attention paid to dirt, right? Um, and what that can tell us, uh, in addition to artifacts, material culture, right? Um, so. Uh, I use those methods and I apply them towards questions in Native North America, uh, specifically the Eastern Woodlands. I work elsewhere um, west of the Mississippi, um, but most of my recent research and where I see my career going will focus on, you know, the Southeast uh, and the Eastern Woodlands broadly. Um, I, I have a lot of my experience so far in research is really focused on uh, the archaic period in North America. Um, so we're talking, you know, uh, well, as a whole, uh, eight, nine thousand years ago, up to about three thousand years ago or so, um, with, you know, three divisions of early, middle and late archaic. Um, a lot of my dissertation research was focused on late archaic period sites uh, in the lower Mississippi Valley, uh, mostly Mississippi and Louisiana. Um, but I also uh, have other projects going, like in North Carolina, uh, I'm a citizen of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina, so we do, uh, I started a community archaeology project with Artipo, um, and so that's where a lot of my focus and, and um, energy is going lately. Uh, that's a big lift to get a, pro a new project like that off the ground. 
Um, but that's what we're doing, and we're excited about it. Uh, we're about to uh, ha uh, hold our first inaugural uh, App State Lumbee Tribe Field School uh, down in Robinson County, which is our kind of cultural and governmental part, you know. Um, so I think that's enough. I don't want to keep going, <laughs> but um, I'm with I'm happy to go wherever you want to talk about next. Cool. Uh, kind of. So one thing that I, I don't want to get like too off the rails, but like the archaic period, um, the it, it's such a rich time period. First off, it's super long in relationship to like the woodland yeah. stuff, but it's also so subversive uh, of a concept because it was established, I, I think, in like the 30s as this idea of like mobile hunter gatherers. They don't have villages. They don't have social hierarchies. They don't have pottery. And they don't have uh, any like domestic plant domestication, but they have all of that. It's just like yeah. happening in, in in different ways, um, in in like little uh, pockets. In, yeah, in, it's it's not it's not the norm anywhere, but it's all happening. Um, so let's let's I think start off uh, talking about poverty point. Um, not you know we can uh, link to ancient America's like uh, his summary of poverty point. Um, I don't want to get into that. I, I want to get more into the the, the poverty point concept, um, the com poverty point culture, and and kind of what that is, and then the problems with it. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know. So like you've already like you've already hinted at right this. Um, the, the term of the archaic, right, this concept of the archaic period uh, was kind of first articulated in the 30s. I'm pretty sure it was in the, the early 30s. I believe it was specifically by an archaeologist uh, named William Ritchie. And I think he was uh, kind of articulating that concept of the archaic period from archaeology he was doing in New York State, I believe. But every every since ever ever since then, I think that, that that definition of the archaic period, right? They're foragers, they're hunter-gatherers, uh, they're people who the archaic period from the onset, I guess is what I'm trying to get at, has been really defined about uh defined by attributes that they we perceive them to lack as societies, right? Uh if you have well, older, older um, definitions of the archaic was, did they make pottery? No, we know that's more nuanced now, right? But did they farm? Did, were they sedentary? No, no. Well, then they're archaic period societies, right? Um, obviously, over the decades, right, over the last century almost, our, our understanding of archaic period foraging societies, right, has become much more nuanced. Uh, they did a lot of those things, like you were talking about, Nate, that you, you kind of flagged there. Um, uh, and that's certainly the case with the poverty point culture. Uh, the poverty point culture uh, used kind of in the traditional way um, was kind of first defined in the you know, 1950s, I'd say, um, where archaeologists James Ford, Phil Phillips, uh, James Griffin, uh, a lot of these uh, pioneers of lower Mississippi archaeology, they were working at the Poverty Point site, right, in Louisiana. And um, it's, it's clearly this really impressive site uh, physically, right? I mean, the, the earthworks are, are massive. Uh, and right from the beginning, it, it seemed to not fit with current understandings of archaic period societies, right, foraging societies. Um, because of uh, assumptions about those societies, social complexity, right? Um, going back to that traditional uh, definition of the archaic, you know, you could see that at play um, in some of the first publications about Poverty Point, right? It was seen as the base assumptions were uh, archaic period societies are um, simple, they're egalitarian politically or socially, you know, everybody, there's no one that's going to um, have inherent leadership uh, rights, things like that. So how can we make sense of the Poverty Point site, right? Because it seems like it would be impossible to build earthworks on that scale without some sort of institutionalized leadership or, or hierarchy. Uh, so from the beginning, you see this tension between what the Poverty Point site seems to be saying about you know, forging archaic period societies in Louisiana and Mississippi and what that 
what those archaeological expectations were for those societies. And so from the very beginning, you get these um, uh, culture historical uh, approaches to poverty point, right? Um, that's referring to that, this archaeological paradigm, right? The culture history paradigm. Uh, and I think to keep that concise, I think what what we, what listeners need to know about that approach, right? The culture history approach um, is that it was very normative and it was very materially based. And by normative, I mean, most culture historians, uh, they viewed culture as something that was stored in people's minds, right? Cultural norms. Uh, and those norms were then reflected and manifest in material culture that people people made, right? And that was kind of the base, the, the foundational justification for culture historians emphasizing materiality big time, like stone points, uh, certain projectile point styles, pottery styles, what have you, as material traits, normative traits, right, that were reflective of some ideal poverty point culture. And then they could go out into the lower Mississippi Valley and find those same material traits. And if they found them on other sites, that was indicative of a shared poverty point culture that they were implicitly, sometimes explicitly, uh, saying originated at the poverty point site. And a lot of that, I think, was due to just how impressive it is, right? Uh, the natural assumption, especially at a time before we had a lot of radiocarbon dating capabilities and we had to rely on these relative uh, artifactual chronologies, right? The assumption was that those that that cultural normative package, right, of of certain material culture originated at poverty point and spread from there. Okay, so I I have I've thought about this in terms of like uh, before radiocarbon dating, we have like the battleship curves to figure out yeah. like these these processes, and I can throw a picture of like what that looks like. Um, but how were they how were they squaring this with the idea that like a concept emerges, it becomes popular, and then it falls out of fashion. When you've got Poverty Point that just kind of, it, as far as it had been expressed before, it just kind of shows up out of nowhere fully fully manifests on one site and then allegedly spreads from there. Like, how, that, that doesn't even work within the paradigms of, uh, you know, culture change that they were operationalizing at the time? Yeah, that's a great question. Great point. Um, I think what what we were dealing with at that point, again, in the 1950s and 60s, was they they thought that they had a lot more time to work with, right? And, and I mean, like, they thought they had a much longer runway as far as the development of poverty point culture, and that, again, was due to a lack, in many cases, a lack of any um, radiocarbon dates or absolute dates. Uh, and even when those started to show up in the late 50s, some of the first radiocarbon dates, right, um, I mean, in America, but I mean, yeah, it's certainly at Poverty Point, even those, they had really large error ranges. And so that, that fuzzy, um, absolute dated, you know, chronology, um, and also the scarcity. There was only a few dates and they had very large error ranges. Uh, the assumption underlying a lot of that early work was that I think that they had, they thought they had a longer runway uh, for that to develop and manifest itself at poverty point. So I would say that they were, they were not aware and I don't, they were not, early archaeologists were not entertaining the possibility that poverty point, the site was an eventful thing, right? They had no way to measure eventful you know, um, history back then, right? So a lot of this, it was their their sense of chronology and time was so heavily based on relative chronologies built with artifact types and things like that, material traits that um, I simply think they had. They were they were they thought they were contextualizing their archaeology within this long development of poverty point culture. So they're thinking this is happening over the course, gradually over the course of like 2000 years, when it's really Correct. these punctuated episodes over the course of like 500 years. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um. So 
a lot of the viewers of the channel will have heard of Poverty Point. Very few will have heard of Jake Town. So can you give us a kind of, uh, and again, I can put up maps and things. Can you give us like an overview of like what Jake Town is and then start like getting into how it relates to Poverty Point um, through the, the the work that you've been doing there? Sure. Yeah. So Jake Town is a site in West Central Mississippi. It's uh it's down in the Mississippi River floodplain. Um, and it's about, you know, uh, I don't know, 30, 30 miles or so west of the current Mississippi River. Uh and that that it being in a floodplain is important, um, and especially in its relation to the poverty point site, which is not far away. I think it's like a hundred kilometers, you know, as the Crow flies uh, between Jake Town and Poverty Point. But Poverty Point is up on a Pleistocene Age terrace, right, overlooking the floodplain. Um, Jake Town is down in the floodplain. Uh, and as far as kind of the history of archaeology done at Jake Town, it was a uh, work that shortly before uh, some of the largest excavations were conducted at the Poverty Point site. But they're they're more or less contemporaneous as far as like when they came on the archaeological radar, um, being the 1950s, right? And so uh, from the very beginning, Jake Town was recognized as a uh, kind of a satellite poverty point site, right? And that was because it had a lot of the same material culture, you know, had a lot of uh, it had P uh, PPOs, poverty point objects, right? These baked clay objects that are shaped and decorated uh, in various ways. Uh, those are found in tremendous quantities at Poverty Point, tons, I think, literally metric tons. Uh, and then they're found in quite high, you know, quantities at Jake Town, too. So that was one thing right off the bat that kind of put it on people's radar that uh, this is a Poverty Point site, a uh, cultural site. Also, similar projectile point forms, uh, there were mounds at Jake Town. So you're looking at these traits, uh, like mound building, right? Um, and they were uh, basically the, the lowest archaeological excavation levels at Jake Town were uh, they lacked pottery, right? And so that was kind of the last uh, feather in the cap of Jake Town for archaeologists to connect it to Poverty Point. Um, and the, again, the kind of um, the culture historical framing of, of, of Jake Town was that due to these similarities in material culture, and cultural traits like earthwork building, that it was a kind of a periphery uh, um, satellite uh, village of, of the larger Poverty Point culture, which is again manifested earliest and most clearly at the Poverty Point site, right, where it takes its namesake from Poverty Point culture. Um, and so with that came these assumptions about the chronology, the history of J-Town, right? It clearly had to be or excuse me, had to be younger, right, than the Poverty Point site, because the assumption was that a lot of it looked like Poverty Point because of some sort of uh, cultural contact, right, uh, with, the, with the type site. And that's why, you know, it had it shared these similarities. That was the original sort of thought. Yeah, so it's like an ex like they're they're modeling like an explosion kind of like you have the Poverty Point thing that blows up and then you have these smaller copycats in the yep. hinterlands. Yeah. OK, yep. yeah. You know, and I'll, I'll say one more thing that there are just to give your listeners like an idea of the extensiveness of this original uh, conception of poverty point culture. There are hundreds of sites in the lower Mississippi Valley. So from the where the kind of the, the Ohio River joins the Mississippi all the way down to the coast. Right. That's what we're talking about. The lower roughly the, the lower Mississippi Valley. Um, so hundreds of sites uh, documented through there. And over the years, you know, if, if a site didn't produce ceramics or a component at a site did not produce ceramics, it uh, had a one, just one of some of these material trait, you know, uh, traits defined at poverty point, like if it had PPOs or if it had certain diagnostic projectile points um, and like pottery, it was basically, you know, a, a designated a poverty point cultural site, right? So you get like, if you're looking at that on a map from the 1950s, these, these reports, or, you know, 19, certainly by the 1970s, after more work's been done, it's like hundreds of dots on a map of poverty point sites, Jake Town's one of them. Okay, in the, in the disc, you talk about how 
uh, I think Jake Town is, if you're looking at like a goodness of fit for poverty point, you know, the poverty point phenomenon, Jake Town's only the third best fit. Yeah. What's what's the second best? And what made it better than Jake Town to well, what made it more similar to Poverty Point than Jake Town? Uh there so to answer your I think second question first, like what what made it a better fit? The like uh Clarence uh Clarence Webb, um different early Poverty Point archaeologists who did a lot of great work, right? Um it's not a criticism of the work, but what they were using was these uh, these charts, man. You know, you've probably seen these, and I'm sure you can throw up a photo of these later. But like these these culture history, uh, you know, material trait charts, right? Like literally, you know, down the y axis, you had traits, right? Earthwork building, uh, poverty point objects, motley projectile points, you know, so on and so forth. Steatite vessels, like steatite bowls made out of soapstone, steatite. steatite. <laughs> And it just went on and on. And then you had across the X axis up top, you had sites, right? And then you would go down and literally put a check mark and you would, uh, you know, tally them up how many of those traits it shared with that constellation of traits defined at poverty point. And that was literally, and they were like numerically ranked more or less. Um, that was really popular in the late 1960s or early 1970s, that kind of approach. So that it was a very, uh, again, kind of uh, normative taxonomic approach to, to gauging cultural affinity. Um, and, you know, there, to be honest, and there, there are so there are these explicit numerical rankings. Jake Town's up there, top three. The second one may have been Teoc Creek. I honestly can't remember. It could have been um, Claiborne. Uh, but the I think the more important uh, um, point is that's how they were judging that with that with that list right um and so whatever that second one was it was just it had another few check marks right um then j town so that was how that was kind of teased out okay yeah um okay so then getting into like uh how how is Jake Town like interrupting this like normative view of, you know, the the poverty point explosion and um, like th this idea that people at poverty point like gave poverty point culture to the people in the in the periphery? Yeah, so. One thing, the, to answer, so let's address how Jake Town was starting to reach into this first. Mm -hmm. Um well, when I started my dissertation work at Jagtown in the summer of 2018, uh, we started right off the bat looking at that site through, like I mentioned earlier during my introduction, a geoarchaeological perspective, right? So we almost, almost none of our excavations at Jagtown were new excavations, right? We, we I think in, on one occasion, broke like undisturbed ground. So why is that important? It's because we were looking at things through that geoarchaeological perspective. So we were more or less concerned with going in and reopening up old excavation units, of which there were a lot, right, uh, going back in the 1950s. So we could re-excavate backfill, right? Didn't have artifacts in it. It was already disturbed. And we could clean up those profiles, the walls of those, of those units, and go in and sample with geoarchaeological sampling uh, methods and looking for ultra fine, like single year species, uh, like plants and seeds and stuff, targeting for radiocarbon, carbon dating, right? To get really tight air ranges and really good dates. And um, pairing that with the geoarchaeology and cre kind of creating what we call a chronostratigraphic, you know, uh, uh, framework, being able to marry up high precision radiocarbon dates with an understanding of site formation and, and how those 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 strata form there and teasing apart different phases of the site. Um, so that was sort of the approach. And very, very quickly, we started getting unexpected dates uh, from those carbon, those radiocarbon samples. Uh, and as our sample size got big enough to build some some chronological models, using like Bayesian chronological modeling statistics and things like that, 
we saw it took pretty quickly. It was evident that that things were happening at Jagtown, whether it was just site occupation, right, through, you know, dating those types of contexts, uh, earthwork, instances of mound building, dating those, um, instances of uh, foreign rock, foreign being, it's, it's being traded, it's being brought in from far away, uh, Novaculite from Arkansas, like different places, dating those contexts where those foreign lithic materials are found. At every level, all of those things are happening earlier at J-Town than they were happening, than we see the appearance of those traits, those innovations, those traditions at Poverty Point. So right off the bat, we were kind of faced with this uh, contradiction. The data did not support the extant understanding of Poverty Point culture and the directionality of that cultural package you know, being ground zero at Poverty Point and spreading outward. Um, right off the bat, pretty quickly, we were having to square that reality with that doesn't fit the history of J-Town. So instead of having a, like an explosive model where things start at Poverty Point and radiate out, it really, you're, it sounds more like we're seeing like Poverty Point as the culmination of something that was kind of happening at more of a grassroots level within the region earlier. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it. And, you know, we weren't the first to say this, honestly. When you look back at the literature, there were signs and clues of this um, earlier, like Teoc Creek. That is a uh, site in uh, northern Mississippi. I might be crossing my wires. It's a, it's a famous uh, poverty point site, but it's older. They had the, the few radiocarbon dates they had. They were you know, it wasn't tremendously older than Poverty Point, right? But they were, they were, you know, getting consistently getting radiocarbon dates from Teoc Creek. That was a really good material fit, you know, for those that checkbox approach as being a Poverty Point site. But it, the radiocarbon dates were really kind of uh, hovering around like 3,800 years ago, right? And and for a quick reminder for your listeners, you know, with some of the earliest context that we see at Poverty Point, the Poverty Point site, you know, that's around 3,600 years ago at the oldest. So that was kind of on people's radars. But to be honest, again, in hindsight, a lot of archaeologists just sort of like, you know, I think the reaction was like, huh. And they just sort of worked around it. You know, like there were there were lots. I think the general attitude was, well, you know, maybe a little earlier. It's just not that consequential to date, you know, and or maybe the error ranges or the, were kind of uh, squint to that. And they made sense of it. Like, well, if you look at the youngest end of that distribution, right, of a probability yeah. distribution of that date range, then it actually does fit. Right. There was a lot of that going on, um, which makes sense. I mean, that was like N of one. Right. They didn't have one. The radiocarbon dating resolution wasn't great for those dates. And they had in their minds probably this much more immense set of this body of work through the yeah. material, right? They and it just didn't fit that uh that early Tioc date, uh Tioc date just didn't fit. So, but there were signs. Once we understood that at Jake Town, there were signs like that in the literature, but it just wasn't emphasized. Yeah, and like I I have I've caught myself making that exact same mistake before with other stuff. Like uh anytime I've talked about poverty point. Uh, the copper objects. Yeah. It's been so strong in the literature that those things are coming down from uh, from the Great Lakes. And then there was the Mark Hill paper talking about, well, we've tested six of these things and they all cluster better with Appalachian copper yeah. sources. And when I read that, my reaction was not 100% of these artifacts came from uh, from Appalachia, my reaction was, oh, cool, Appalachia is contributing too, but most of it is still probably coming from, because like I've already got this thing yeah. in my head and I, I didn't really internalize what I was reading. Like people make these kinds of mistakes all the time when it's the very first time the, you know, the model is being contradicted. 100%. Now, now I'm glad you brought that up because it's a really good segue for like talking about what we see, me and my co-authors, what we what we saw is the the issue, uh, the interpretive issue, right? And it's exactly what you're talking about, right? This this um, you know, you get comfortable with a narrative and a and a um and a, a body of evidence and the way you think that those puzzle pieces fit together, right? And it and it takes a lot to overcome that, like cognitively, right? Like for archaeologists, and it happens to me too. It happens to all of us, right? For Poverty Point, what we ended up, um, you know, we published a paper on this last year, not long ago, um, 
where we kind of pointed the finger at the the culture history paradigm, right? Uh, and that normative approach, again, you know, as really emphasizing material culture as a kind of reflection of a mental norm of what it meant to be poverty point, right? And when you you use that approach, this is not new. We've uh, we archaeologists at large, we've understood the pitfalls of this approach for decades now. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't still affect us, right? And um, that was our that's been our argument, and continues to be our argument of why it's so difficult to change the narrative on a uh, poverty point because we inherit right a lot of great work too. You know, these archaeologists in the fifties they were doing incredible work, but it's just that we have the methods. I think now we have the methods like radiocarbon dating, chronological modeling. We have uh, more nuanced even excavation protocols from like geoarchaeology. We can get. Um, the point here and our theories, right, have have become more nuanced. The point being that I think we we can we can offer as archaeologists much more nuanced and historical explanations of ancient, you know, human history uh, in ways that culture history, as a theoretical paradigm, right, and as approach to archaeology, it was not geared towards answering. Right. Uh, and that's again, it's not a fault. It's just that we've moved on like we can move on. But yet we still are hindered by these these uh, biases in our mind because we're you know still largely taught in a lot of ways. And certainly textbook treatments of human history a lot of times take on this, you know, culture history model. Right. Um, and so I think we're just at a point where we have the methods and our theories have caught up. We can move past it, but it takes a lot of kind of getting over that cognitive dissonance, you know, and moving past it. I have to ask, though, like, pedagogically, how the hell do you try to explain to a a newcomer to our newcomer to archaeology any of this stuff without having a culture historical framework? Like, you, you, you set that up as like your, your uh, like, not kindergarten version, but like your, your basic yeah. elementary explanation and then as you know your understanding becomes more mature you're able to kind of show how that normative view is really a a low resolution understanding of it like i don't understand how we could teach how you can jump straight to the nuanced version without having a low res framework to build off of do you do you think that's right or do you think we can dispense with it altogether oh no i don't and i don't want to dispense with it altogether certainly in teaching context right but i think we can because like you're saying it's necessary those building blocks of understanding material culture and relative time right like what happened here as far as and how these things are manifest in material culture right the basis of archaeology all of that i think still has a place in in archaeology right especially when you're going into a new area and trying to understand the the broad contours of the archaeology there but the way that i do teach uh you know undergrads this stuff is teaching them right from the start, the pitfalls of that, and so that they're aware of that t- of that thinking. Well, then we can get into more nuanced discussions, but that are still appropriate for an undergrad classroom, right, about how our prejudices as, you know, m- modern citizens and all, and all uh, quote unquote, you know, Western societies, right, how we project those things back into ancient cultures that may have, may, may have understood the world very differently. And so like, when we when we look at these um archaeology or ancient history in a way that is kind of uh, A has to happen before B, before C, and ultimately you get to farming societies and all of these things. That's a very Western kind of what we call, you know, it's a big uh, $10 word, teleology, right? Mm -hmm. It's just that history has some sort of awareness of itself and that you're your the goal of all societies is are to become settled farmers, you know. So when we when you kind of introduce those ideas right from the start, I think you can teach culture history and and, and understandings of culture of, of, of ancient history that are derived from culture history, um, while students are becoming more aware from the get-go uh, of the pitfalls of that. But also again, I think a lot of this, like the way that I teach poverty point, is just, you know, ask students um how how complex our world is and it's always been that way right so is it you know is it that hard to grasp right that that 
poverty point, whatever whatever it represents on a meta level, like poverty point culture, is it that hard to think that maybe it didn't just, you know, uh, develop at a snap at one place and spread outwards? People are complex. Culture is complex. Um, and so when we really start to unpack that, I think it's it becomes almost more likely that history is more complicated than ground zero uh, and origin for all material traits that we identify as poverty point and they spread out. Um, it's not I don't find that it's hard for students to wrap their head around that there were individual places like Town where some of these innovations and traditions appeared first. And then there was maybe probably other sites that we don't even um, we haven't worked at, at yet in, in the lower Mississippi Valley that are like Jaketown that are earlier. And certain we see certain uh, manifestations of poverty point culture there earlier and that these these peaceful traits that we you know called called them traits, uh, certain projectile point forms, certain uh, modes of earthwork construction. They develop variably in time and space, right? And then they converge at poverty point, and we see those all those all those desperate uh, desperate pieces put together in a coherent whole at poverty point, um, and that it's sort of the last event in this poverty point phenomenon. Um, that's the way I teach it, just with transparency about you know what I mean. All the things we just talked about, and I think uh, I find certainly our students are they're they're. Uh, they're totally capable of understanding that more nuanced uh, approach to it. Um, and so, but it's a great, yes, yeah, a great question. And, and the answer, again, it's circle back in a more concise way is that, no, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? It does help facilitate teaching. Okay. You touched on two things that I want to get into. One is uh, like you, you talk about indigenous philosophy in your disc quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and uh -huh. I, I do want to head there, but I also want to talk about like this idea of the, the normative poverty point culture. It kind of implies that everyone's got that, like, this is like a unified thing, right? But yeah. anyone who's ever been to a conference or a music festival or any of these, these are metropolitan phenomena. These are all oh, yeah. people it that, do not see each other as part of the same thing, except the fact that they're all participating in the event, you know? Um, so, but, but going, going on to the indigenous philosophy philosophies and how this Im impacts uh, your, you know, theoretical framework. Um, and it's, it's just to kind of like lay some foundational so like so much of in like the indigenous philosophies that uh we get into in, in grad school has to do with not just human to human interactions but the relationships between person and place and people and place and you know human non-human relationships um so i i wonder if you want to talk about that in relationship to this broader phenomenon also Sure. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, for the for the listener, what what we're talking about here is that you've heard me criticize. Right. You've heard me criticize culture history. Right. OK. It's simplistic. We need to move beyond it. So what is that's naturally the next question. Well, then what do you suggest we use in place of that? Right. To explain this specifically poverty point. How would you like to explain poverty point if this kind of normative approach is uh, insufficient? And so. That's a difficult question to answer, right? Because poverty point, that place just doesn't make a lot of sense, no matter how we look at it, right? That's why, and it's been that way for quite a while. It's, it's an anomalous place um, in a lot of ways. So uh, that's a short way of saying that I found a lot of uh, kind of theoretical framings, right? When we talk about archaeological theory, it's just a set of thoughts and assumptions that you use to frame your data, right? We all have the same data, more or less. Um, it's that theoretical framing uh, in which we contextualize that data to make interpretations. That's what results in different interpretations, right? So if culture history, and I'm saying that that's a um, unsatisfactory theoretical framing for our data, well, then what do we put there? I, uh, after years of working with this material and, and it not making sense, um, I just thought, you know, well, we should maybe look at what uh, modern, you know, American Indian scholars are saying. Scholars of, of various stripes, not just anthropologists, you know, um, specialists in in pedagogy and teaching, right? Like Gregory Kehete and from uh, he's a Tewa person, and all over the from all over the country. Um, V. F. Cordova, uh, she was a philosopher. Um, 
uh, yeah, like a, a Western trained philosopher, right? And and uh, she's was a citizen of the uh, Hickory Apache Nation, nation, but also folks from the Eastern Woodlands. Uh, and just look at the the common pillars of the systems of thought they they articulated, right? Uh, they're philosophic and epistemological systems. Um, epistemology being that you know how we produce knowledge, right? So the Western scientific method, that's an example of uh, a very common epistemological system, right? But other societies have their own epistemologies, right? So it was looking at, uh, you know, what is a highly culturally and intellectually diverse set of people and scholars, right? That's the first thing you have to acknowledge. It's not that we're saying native people think alike. Like, what does that even mean when we say native folks, you know, American Indians? Like, what does that even mean? There's... 600, I don't know, tribes today, right? That diversity was only more intense in the ancient past. Um, so right off the bat, like culturally and intellectually diverse nations, but we can also squint our eyes, just like how we use Western, you know, uh, theory. That's how we can talk about uh, Emmanuel Kant and Socrates, all of like Western thinkers, right? There's a lot of diversity there, but we can still use it as a body of thought. So um, that's kind of approach I took with, uh, using contemporary American Indian intellectualism as kind of a, a source of theory, and I didn't invent this. Obviously, I'm sure, uh, you know this, but for just to you know for listeners, this has been a growing trend in archaeology and in anthropology. Um, but yeah, I just saw I saw an opportunity to use that sort of theoretical framing um, and put my own kind of twist on it uh, to interpret poverty point in a different way. Uh, and we can talk more specifically about that, however you want to go. From yeah, I, I I would like to hear some specific examples for sure of like like yeah. what are some of these premises that are coming from, uh, maybe not an indigenous canon, but you know like a, a, you know the Native American philosophical tradition and and you know what are some of the interpretive results that came out of that. Sure. Yeah. So. Um... Let's see. I wanted to steal this down and not go on and on about it. <laughs> you know, so so there. So you know, yeah. Surveying the the work of many many uh, contemporary Native scholars and also non-Native, right? Like it's it, you know there are also uh, yeah folks who folks who are not Indigenous who are making great contributions to this these sources of theory that I used. Um, but that that's kind of what we come to expect, right? Like we use a lot of Western philosoph uh, philosophy and epistemology as a source of anthropological theory. That's why I harp on the native side of it is that that's becoming that's more of a novel uh, thing that is becoming more common. But um, yeah, when I surveyed this, this the, all these different you know sets of literature from different disciplines, uh, I saw a lot of. Uh, uh, or I'd say three or four common premises that kept coming up and from from being articulated by native scholars from very different cultures. Right. But yet you can still see a lot of these uh, basic premises, one being this idea of performance. It's called different things, but you can you can see uh, this idea of coming together as a community and performance. This can be. It can be art, it can be song, it can be dance, uh, it can be all these different manifestations of performance, right? And the, the 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 power of performance to actually bring about change in the world, right? So that was one common pillar that I saw um, uh, in a lot of different scholars' work. Another being uh, the idea of the importance of, of harmony and balance, right, in the world. Um, and, and that it was uh, up to the individual and communities that we had this kind of custodian responsibility to maintain balance with our relations, right? That leads, that segues into another pillar, which is like this, these, these uh, relational worldviews, it's been called, this is not new. We've all, we've seen this for a while in a lot of different native systems of philosophy um, and worldviews, right? That we are, uh, Rather than living, you know, humans occupying the apex of a hierarchical kind of a uh, world, right, where humans are at the top and you have like less sentient animals, you have like this binary of uh, nature and not nature, right, culture and nature, the external like wild, potentially wild nature that needs to be tamed and dominated by people. That's kind of a 
for the most part, I think that's a pretty general, um, you know, depiction of Western thought, right? Well, when you get to a lot of these uh, these native scholars, they're describing a world that's relational, right? It's uh, humans occupy, like uh, I think Von Deloria mentions this, um, uh, Gregory Cajete, others, VF Cordova, they say, you know, humans are, are one node in a dense web of relations, right? Uh, and that could be potentially um, with other persons, um, animal persons, spirit persons, right? And it's not that all deer or trees uh, can like get up and talk to you, right? But the idea that some can, right? The, the, the possibility of this idea of expansive personhood, that these, these, these societies typically grant personhood to more things than we are willing to grant personhood in Western societies, right? So if we have those kind of common pillars, right? The power of performance to bring about change in the world and this custodial responsibility of humans to maintain balance among their relations, right? And this relational web um, and this expansive idea of who can be a person, right? And the importance of maintaining harmony between those nodes. Uh, when you apply that to a place like Jaketown, right, um, what I saw was we have plenty of environmental data uh, that, that show that there's a lot of catastrophic flooding uh, uh, on the Mississippi River around 3,000 years ago or so, um, 3,400 years ago, to be more precise. Um, we still don't have a great exact date of when these floods were happening, but basically, Around that time, 34, 33, 3,200 years ago in the lower Mississippi Valley, the entire Mississippi River was changing course from its uh, stage two course to its current stage one course. And in relation to Jaketown, we're talking about the river moved like 20 or 30 miles, it seems like, to its current position. And as that river meandered across its floodplain, it, the, you get the entire you know, force of the Mississippi hitting these oxbow lakes and hitting these underfish streams, right? And it's causing these crazy intense and more frequent flooding events as this is happening. Um, that's well established, again, in paleoenvironmental data. So at the, around that same time, we see a, a, a really eventful burst of mound building at Jaketown, right? Um, we know that through all the chronological modeling and geoarchaeological analysis we've done there. And it looks like that at Jaketown, um, as these flooding events are becoming irregular, I, people are not able to predict the, the ebbs and flows of the river like they should, that they're accustomed to. Um, they are faced with the idea that something's wrong, that a harmony has been upset, right? That, that, that this, the river, which they more than likely viewed as a person potentially, right? that they needed to, again, go back to that custodial responsibility to maintain balance through performance, that as a community, they were using these eventful bursts of mound building and associated practices that we see at Jaketown, like lighting large fires on the sunks of mounds, feasting. Uh, they, that was communal performance in, a, in, a, um, in a, an effort to open up communications with the relevant actors, and it could have been the river itself, of understanding what why this was happening, right? Um, why why the more predictable ebb and flow of the river was being thrown out of whack. And I think that if we think about mound building at Jaketown as a performance to maintain this balance and open up communicative lines, right, with other persons, potentially the river, um, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, it makes sense why they're building multiple mounds simultaneously very quickly at Jaketown, why they're lighting large fires on the mound, why they're uh, installing large posts infrastructure around the mounds um, and all that's happening before we see similar eventful bursts of mound building at poverty point um, and so it opens up the possibility and I think the likelihood that what we're seeing is we've thought about poverty point kind of backwards that it's the it's an event like the one at Jaketown but you see these other communities probably like the one at Jaketown all dealing with this flooding and this environmental volatility uh, through communal performance, and then when that apparently doesn't, uh, when that fails, right? I mean, the, the flooding continued to happen. You see the abandonment of Jaketown, 
And if look, all data point to the, you know, the scenario where people at Jake Town literally go to Poverty Point and Poverty Point is so huge, it wasn't just them. So I assume, right, as we learn more and do more archaeology in the LMB, we'll find other places like Jake Town and they had their own sets of performances to deal with this volatility. But they ultimately met up at Poverty Point in this last ditch kind of performance at this titanic scale. Right. Uh, and that's and, I, and that's where the ex, I think the um, the logic of poverty point lies. It's in this convergence of multiple streams of native history and culture and um, these communal performances and this last ditch effort, uh, this mega performance. You know, that also explains why. Why is not there other? Why aren't there other poverty points? You said that it's like it kind of just appears and it's without comparison i mean it's it's there's nothing in it like it in the archaic world right like there's no tail um, on it once poverty no. ends, end <laughs> there's nothing else yeah exactly um, and there's nothing so, before or after it you know like bits like that for a long time so a couple of things that i i one thing that i want to be i don't think you're saying that i want to be really clear on is i i've had a lot of people suggest that like the uh the ditches and banks at poverty point or just well they're trying to build this thing to put their houses on so when it floods their house doesn't flood and i don't think that's what you're what you're suggesting here at all no correct i'm not and um again that goes back to this the actual setting the physical setting of poverty point it's up on a pleistocene terrace right pleistocene epoch you know ice aka the ice age mm -hmm. right it runs from Two million years ago to roughly eleven thousand years ago, when megafauna go extinct and stuff, right? We're and talking more than ten thousand years too old to be relevant to, exactly. to all this. Exactly. So, but it is up on this this very ancient terrace that overlooks the floodplain, and what what that means practically is that it's the there even with this huge flood that I'm talking about, this you know thousand year flood. There's no evidence that that flood, that flood, we don't have alluvial deposits like floodborne sediments being deposited at Poverty Point. It's too high up. So that that they're, they're, that's not what they were doing. You know, yeah, like you said, um, the earthworks served some other purpose, but it wasn't uh, literally to elevate, you know, houses and things like that um, for floodwaters. Um, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's already up high on that terrace. Yeah, I've also had a lot of people like insist that it must have been a complete circle originally. <laughs> um, but everything that I've I've looked at suggests that that terrace was already the shape that it was. And this was always a set of semicircles. Oh, yeah. And that's I mean, that's why I went probably into maybe too much detail with the Pleistocene because there's a Pleistocene terrace. It didn't erode. 3,000 years ago, like the rest of that circle, that, that terrace looked like what it looks like. You know what I mean? It's a Pleistocene age terrace. And of course, erosion happens in smaller scales, but no, yeah, that, it, it didn't. Those earthworks were always semicircular. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of like, like little, like bits and pieces that I want to touch on um, while we're still kind of in the realm of, uh, you know, indigenous philosophy. Um, this is something that's always kind of fascinated me about Poverty Point is the owl beads. And throughout so much of the uh, eastern woodlands, even today, owls are these like very powerful, not necessarily evil, but like you don't mess with owls. There, There's something that doesn't really get depicted very often and it, there's like an aversion to them but at poverty point they're all about the owls what like mm -hmm. what do you think has changed between you know th this like deep poverty point time and you know the point of contact where everyone seems to agree we don't we don't mess with owls Nate, to be honest, I, the, first of all, I don't know, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's a great question. And we also, it's not just owls. You're you're 100 percent correct. That it, there's a huge emphasis on owls at Poverty Point. But we also see depictions of other things like what's been called the fox man. Uh, these, you know, anthropomorphic uh, human fox, you know, uh, hybrids, uh, at least one artifact. I think there's more, but of, uh, I think it's etched on sto on soapstone, right? Um, uh, but there are other uh, other beings, you know, depicted at Poverty Point, but the owl, yeah, huge emphasis on the owl. Uh, and I don't know, I mean, but here, again, I want to be clear, I'm speculating right now, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. 
the you know I think I do think that it's probably related to Poverty Point seems like a watershed moment in the history of Native North America, right? Its appearance is abrupt and dramatic and totally without comparison in North America, right? Of anything that ever existed before that we know of, right? At, at every scale of analysis and comparison, it is unique, right? And it comes out of nowhere. And then afterwards, it seems to be rapidly abandoned, right? We don't like it just stops. Uh, and we don't see places like Poverty Point until the middle of them, like Hopewell, Dina stuff, you know what I mean? Like these, yeah. it's just about, you know, so that's, it, that should tell us that we're dealing with something historically significant to like native cultures in the Southeast. And so while I say all that, to say that I, I think that after Poverty Point, the world changed. You know, like I just I don't and I know that that's vague. And again, I'm speculating, but it's just it's educated speculation. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like, look at the facts that we have. And um, so, again, going back to your original question, I, I think the fact that some of the iconography at Poverty Point seems to change dramatically with, you know, native uh, iconography later on. I think that the answer is somewhere in this, you know, this event of whatever we're dealing with that led to a the creation of poverty point what i've argued is this mega performance right of multiple communities and b when when that is walked away from you know i think the world changed and i and i think that it had probably had ripple effects on on belief systems and how they're manifested materially right like how may, many native societies in the southeast view owls uh, or whatever other example you want to use, right? Um, I think things just changed dramatically after Poverty Point. And there were other things going on, like they're, they're not comparable to Poverty Point, but you've got the Shell Mound Archaic going on at about the same yeah, time, yeah. and uh, and you know things like this. But um, yeah, do you uh, <sighs> something else that I did I wanted to touch on, kind of related to this? Are are I haven't gotten far enough into the dis? I think. Um, you set up like most people are of one of two minds. They either think that Poverty Point is a permanently occupied city by a large population. And then mm -hmm. there's the whole like vacant uh, ceremonial grounds where like there are people living there, but it's a fraction of the total intended population for, you know, whatever gatherings. Do you tend to fall on one side or the other of that? Divide? Yeah. So, yeah. Dude, well, you know, not like. I, I, so I think that um, if we accept that Poverty Point was very eventful, like I've like I've argued, and it's this eventful performance, then I think that it 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 kind of uh, it's neither, right? Like I don't know if it's it was ever a vacant ceremonial center in the sense that it was visited over and over and, and was this static place that was built slowly over time. Um, I and then. The same goes for the other side of that argument, right? That it was a village. I don't think there's very little evidence of like actual structures and stuff like domestic structures at Poverty Point. There's middens, there's, you know, there's enriched, you know, organically enriched um, soils and stuff. But like it's, 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 you can definitely argue uh, that for either one of those, right? That a lot of people live there or a lot of people didn't. And there's not great evidence for either, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but, you know, if we think about, uh, for instance, you know, there's research that shows geo geoarchaeological research um, that that Mound A, the largest mound at, at Poverty Point, it's been called the bird mound, you know, um, and it's debatable whether or not it's an effigy of a bird or not. But I think that goes uh, too far into the realm of like radical speculation. To, yeah, it's T-shaped. It's not that it's T -shaped. T shaped. Exactly. So. Whatever that mound originally looked like, it's huge. It's like you know, it's um, it, it's it's seventy massive. feet tall and, and yeah, and 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 research really you know nuanced empirically backed up research there shows that that mound was built in no more than ninety days. Yeah. Um, and so if we when we know that, and then everywhere we've looked in the ridges and done similar repeated that. That that methodology that at Mound A through chronostratigraphic you know analysis, uh, everywhere we've looked in the ridges, they those look to have been built 
almost instantaneously, right? Um, everywhere we've looked so far, we'll continue to look, but uh, so that may change. But the point is, is everywhere we look, my poverty point is built very quickly. And so I think that, you know, what you see at Poverty Point is just uh, you know meeting up of multiple communities to to do these monumental earth moving projects. Uh, and so I don't know. I think I think we're getting to a point where we're arguing about the the um, permanency of you know occupants at Poverty Point maybe misses misses the point. Yeah, I, I think yeah. that it's regardless, it's an eventful thing. Um, so I don't know if it was like a city in the way that we think of cities or really sedentary places. People may have lived there over months while they built these huge earthworks. But does that make it like a village like we think of? Uh, I think it's still, you know, the point being it's this eventful thing that a lot of people apparently took place and took part of, you know. Yeah. And when we talk about eventful too, like in unless the understanding on this has changed pretty significantly like there are multiple stages to these events right like yeah. you know uh the uh i think it's mounds b and c go seem to go up first and then a couple hundred years passes and then the ridges go up and then a few yeah. hundred years pass and then you know various other like smaller elements and then mound a goes up at the very end and that's like the last major construction and then silence after that correct and so a uh, couple things i'll hit on there is that um so my co-author and my former uh graduate you know mentor for my phd tr kidder he's done a lot of ways made a career out of poverty point research mm -hmm. he's uh one that originally postulated that Mound B, I believe, at Poverty Point was built like uh, as early as 3600 BP. And after he's revisited that, his his own work in light of new, new data and things like that, uh, he thinks that he was um, too confident in saying that and that that date is, is based on a single date uh, coming out of Mound B for that early construction uh, date, that it really what he should have said was that it was built sometime between 3600 and 3400 BP, right? Uh, so even the oldest mound, like Mound B at Poverty Point, may have been built closer to the other ones, around 3400 BP. Um, but let's say that it, we don't know. Like that's the inherent error range of some radiocarbon dates, mm -hmm. right? So I don't want to come off like we're construing or twisting the data to fit our narrative. Let's, let's say in a hypothetical scenario that that the construction of Mount B does lie in that far uh, early in 3600 BP, right? That is not surprising because we have to understand if we accept our, my argument, right? Um, and, and TRs too, who's co-authored these things with me as well as Dr. Grace Ward. Um, if we accept, if people start accepting this narrative that there are other places where Poverty Point begins on the outside and, this and the Poverty Point site is this convergence of all these places and people, right? At around 3400 BP, and, po and poverty point, you know, blows onto the scene. Why did they go there? It must have been already been a place that people were familiar with, that people met at, and and in fact, the archaeology seeks, you know, it, it supports that, right? There have been people doing things on that terrace, that that spot of ground that would pop, become poverty point for thousands of years. So, you know, if they, if there was a mound there, that would not surprise me, right? As far back as 3600 BP, right? Let's say that that mound was there. And because, you know, it was probably part of a landscape that people had already known about. Maybe it was already a place of aggregation and, you know, meeting up of different groups. And maybe that's why they went there and built the poverty point that we know of in this eventful burst around 34, 3300 years ago. Yeah. Not to get like too far into Bourdieu, but like <laughs> if among among modern indigenous people, there's like there are ceremonial grounds and there's like kind of a ceremonial season where like yeah. every it's part of the year like we get together yeah. and we do these things and if that's a you know if that's a deeply structural element of all of these communities that every year we get together and we do something like yeah. we perform something mm -hmm. that performance it's it's there are forces at play within that structure that could very easily cause the something that we do when we get together at these ceremonial grounds every year to turn into something massive, especially if your belief is that by doing something massive, you are um, mending a relationship with 
you know, the river or or something along those lines. Absolutely. Great points. Yeah. And, um, you know, that I think that the, the logic of poverty point lies in that kind of arena and that kind of cultural setting. Right. Um, and, you know, not not in some of the other um, alternative explanations that have been offered by archaeologists that. Like it was a hierarchical society that was kind of ahead of its time, right? <clears throat> and that uh, you essentially see in the massive mounds the manifestation of political power and like incipient, you know, like the beginnings of hierarchical societies and stuff like that, aggrandizement of chiefs or something, you know, along those lines. And um, that's the way the mounds have been uh, explained by, now, by some archaeologists. And, you know, I just don't think that. Uh, I think that's, again, missing the point and missing what, you know, uh, again, we can't we can't talk about. It's not a perfect match talking about thirty five hundred years ago and using, you know, modern native uh, intellectual traditions. Obviously, that's still a huge gap to to link. But I do think we're on like more secure interpretive grounds if we if we do it that way and use that as just a source of a source of theory, right? Mm -hmm. And in conjunction with Western like derived theory and anthropology, right? Using those two things together, uh, Sonia Adelaide, right? She's uh, she's talked about this as uh, this approach is braided knowledge. Right, uh, not throwing a lot Western derived anthropological theory and method not throwing that out, right, and not replacing it with native uh, American uh, philosophy or epistemology as this theory, but using both and, like, intertwining these things into a braid. It's a stronger interpretive uh, tool, and I and I totally agree with uh, Dr. Adelaide, I, and that's sort of the approach that I've tried to use. Uh, I also want to be really uh, one thing that I want to clarify is that <laughs> Uh, a couple of things. One, that using, you know, literature, right, published literature of Native American scholars, um, that is, that's not a substitute for working with descended communities, right? And um, no, so I want to be really clear, um, and that that's something we still strive for. There are a lot of obstacles uh, in how we do professional archaeology that I think prevents a lot of that. Um, that's probably a topic for another day. Um, but the main point being is that this is not a stand in for working with with living people. Right. We're not living people. Those scholars are living people. But it's simply, you know, it's using that literature. Right. Published literature, just like we use Western theory. Right. No more, no less. And um, another thing that I wanted to make sure the listeners understand is that, you know, where I, in the beginning in the bio, you know, the intro, the uh, biographical you know, intro for myself. Um, you know, just because just because I'm uh, a, a Lumbee citizen, right, that does not mean I'm just as much not a Choctaw, not a Chickasaw. You know what I mean? Like these are we're all different uh, nations with very different histories, both culturally, intellectually. So the other thing I just wanted to say is that I don't view, um, you know, uh, me being native myself as a license to use these things uncritical or uncritically or that I have any sort of special insights to these things. Again, it's just like anybody else, any other scholar can do. Um, just use the literature in the same way that we use Western literature, right? Again, no more, no less, no, no more complicated than that. Um, but those are things that often I think people confuse or get their wires crossed. So I just wanted to kind of throw those those uh, qualifiers out there. Yeah, absolutely. Like de dealing with, um, you know, the the colonial colonial history of the archaeological discipline and also like trying to reintegrate, you know, native voices into the not just the discussion, but the actual process of of what we do. It's always like. It's a fraught topic for sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it requires mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, time and work to adequately explain like what the goal is and, you know, the steps that we're trying to take and the missteps that we're trying not to take also. A hundred percent. And actually, and if I can just add another qualifier or mm -hmm. another, just I, I like to be totally frank, transparent and honest about these things because archaeology, these all these are all fraught topics, right? Um uh, potentially fraught topics, right? Uh, but there are, again, using using native scholars as a source of theory does not uh, excuse in the minds of a lot of a lot of native people from different nations uh, 
the fact that they don't believe mounds should be disturbed, right? For, right. And, that, and that the production of knowledge, even if it's uh, the attempt or the, in, the, the intent is to overturn these um, inaccurate, in my opinion, understandings of mound building in ancient North America, even if the intent is to like, we can explain these better, that's still not, that's not, that's not a reason to disturb mounds in a lot of people's opinions. And those opinions are not shared by all tribes. And then when you get in within a certain tribe, it is individuals have opinions, right? Um, but I say all that to say what we've tried to do and my work at Jake Town is we didn't disturb mounds uh, with new excavations, right? Um, we were careful to only re-excavate old units. Uh, and again, that still doesn't, you know, a lot of people would say, say still stop fooling with mounds, you know, and I understand yeah. that. Um, and uh, I, and just to be honest, it's something that I still wrestle with and I don't know what the future of uh, that kind of research looks like. And I've not made up my mind on, on if I will ever, you know, re-excavate mounds or do any of these things again. I may, I may not. It depends on the tribes I work with and stuff like that. Um, and I just think it's important to be honest about these things, uh, especially to, you know, a uh, popular audience that these are things that our archaeologists are, of our generation are struggling with and, and trying to wrestle with and contemplate and be reflective and respectful. Uh, and so it's it's an ongoing conversation, you know? Yeah, it's certainly an ongoing process. And like, <clears throat> as the, the archaeological, like, there's a shift in our thinking generationally within archaeology as we're kind of seeing with um, the SEAC image policy and all of that, that, that yeah. just went down. Like there's generational changes in how we perceive our role in all of this. And there's also within the indigenous community, generational changes in the kinds of things that they want to see done. And hopefully, you know, that, that growth is going to be towards each other rather than away from each other. But that's, that is yet to be seen for sure. Um, well, we've been talking for a little over an hour now. Do you have time for like a couple of uh, a couple of questions before we uh, before we move on? Absolutely. Cool. Cool. Um, so what we we never actually explicitly explicitly got around to talking about it, but within these like Poverty Point, Jake Town, these kinds of sites, what uh, would we? <sighs> We're asking about like the governance, like how, how how is leadership manifesting? It might be easier to talk about the kinds of governments that we don't see than the kinds of governments that we do see. But like, what can we say about uh, social organization um, on these sites, if anything? That's a great question. Um, it's one I'm happy to discuss. I, I actually te I teach this. Um, a lot how complicated uh, places like Poverty Point are for our for anthropological interpretations of like social structure. Um, but what I'll, I'll say first is that there are plenty of ethnographic examples, right? I'm thinking about like Marcel Moss with Inuit people in the early 1900s. I'm thinking about um, Lowy on the plains with like uh, Cheyenne, I believe, and Lapota. Um, Stra uh, Claude Levy Strauss, uh, working in Brazil with the Namaquara, right? These ethnographic examples of living people, um, who are uh, quote unquote foragers, right? Or they're non agricultural people. And my point, the point that kind of connects them all in my mind, is those are all examples of, um, what they call like dope, uh, double morphology societies, right? Or like seasonal and in situational leadership, mm -hmm. right? So like on the plains, you had um, with Lowy's work, you know, um, the communal bison hunt, the bison drive, when different tribes came together, um, you had the, uh, the institutionalized police force of dog soldiers that were granted situational power, institutionalized police authority, basically, to ensure the success of the bison hunt and it was only during that time and and then when people when those tribes dispersed and those folks dispersed dog soldiers did too as an institution right um 
And uh, with the Namaquara, you see seasonal differences of chiefs, right? Um, during one part of the season, they live on hilltop villages and they are horticulturalists. They grow domesticated plants and they're egalitarian in social structure. And then when that other, uh, I believe the dry season, if I'm remembering correctly with the Namaquara, when they disperse from those hilltop villages into the forest, they, they disperse into smaller groups and they elect, you know, patriarchal chiefs uh, who have a lot of power. But then that power dissipates when they go back to their villages. I could go on and on. But what we're talking about here, my point in saying this is there's plenty of evidence, ethnic, ethnographic evidence of what I would say is arguably much more socially complex structures than, than permanent hierarchy, which is what we, we tend to think of at these places. Is it hierarchical or is it not? And I would say that there's plenty of evidence that, uh, in, and especially the pre-contact, imagine pre-contact past. I, I think that the problem with places like Poverty Point and the, the conversations that we use it as an exemplar for, of like talking about social structure, I think it's the problem is we are not creative enough with the way that we envision social structure and the different possibilities. I think it's that is why we can't explain places like Poverty Point. I think we have a very incomplete and frankly stale understanding of are they egalitarian or are they hierarchical? I think that there's we're talking about very complex social worlds, the possibilities of pre-contact, you know, uh, non-Western societies. Um, and, you know, again, I, I suspect that what we see at Poverty Point, the manifestation of Whatever type of social organization we were, they were using there. If I had to put money on it, I think it's probably closer to these incredibly complex ethnographic examples that we see of of situational and seasonal leadership. That again, I would I would argue is infinitely more complex than like even state hierarchies, state level. You know what I mean? I think that we've become um, very dull in our imagination of what past social complexity can look like. Yeah, um, th there's, a, there's a couple of responses. One, like the European um, and, and people from, from a European cultural tradition have this like, fixation on permanence. Um, yeah. We have to have permanent residences and we have to have permanent structures and we have to go to the same, like the, the, the kind of fascinating thing to me about the archaic is the fluidity of all of it. Yeah. Very little oh, yeah. seems to be really institutionally permanent. Things come and go and then come back. Um, and the other thing I want to talk about was when, when I teach the archaic, when I was teaching the archaic uh, at UT, uh, and this issue of like cultural complexity comes up, like it's it's basically a horrible word to describe something that like the the word complex does not actually mean right uh like just because we say that a you know hunter gatherer society is not com culturally complex does not mean that their lives were not complex it means they don't have like this strict hierarchical system that we have dubbed a complex society um which that word means something in anthropology now, and it's very hard to make that word unmean that particular oh, yeah. thing. Um, okay, so the let's see. Um, th this person's asking about like parallels between the poverty point phenomenon and other things that are going on in like Mesoamerica or South America, which these are ties that people really like to th they want there to be a connection between these things. Um, and as a North American archaeologist, I have a bias that I don't want there to be any connection between these things. Um, do, do, do you have a perspective on on that that uh, you'd like to talk out? Uh, so a couple of things. One is that right off the bat, we can't we're not precluding, you know, uh, cultural contact between like but we, we have to remember. And I think your listeners know this, but it's just worth repeating. Right. Like the, our modern borders and geopolitical boundaries didn't exist. Right. So, like, you know, we have to overcome that uh, potential obstacle in our thinking about what the likelihood of interaction exchange and cultural contact between 
you know, people in the Gulf, American South, for instance, in Mesoamerica, you know, like, uh, so it's, it's, you know, that stuff is possible. And in, and in sometimes in places it happened. Right. Um, but as far as like explaining poverty point in places like it through kind of diffusion from Mesoamerican cultures and things like that, that we can say didn't happen. Right. I mean, that the, 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 uh, <clears throat> like Watson break predates, predates the Olmec, right? So, and Shami, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, Ol the Olmec and the kind of foundational um, Mesoamerican cultures, uh, we these the the seeds, kind of the intellectual cultural seeds of, that it looks like Poverty Point is coming from, um, in Louisiana, Mississippi, these places where mound building began, you know, six thousand year old mounds, arguably a little older, maybe maybe as old as seven thousand years. Uh, they're older than these these uh, foundational Mesoamerican cultures. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say I understand. I understand the interest uh, in that in that. And again, I'm not saying that it's impossible because, you know, we the, those boundaries just weren't there. They were permeable. Right. And um, yeah. but I, as far as like, yeah, the, the birth of like places like Poverty Point, things like that, that's where we can uh, confidently sever that. I mean, there there is no, you know, the, the, the catalyst of places like Poverty Point aren't found in Mesoamerica. No. They're found where they they're found where they started. <laughs> One connection that I will entertain, though, is like, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen um, Dave Anderson always shows this least cost pathway map of where all the exotic materials uh, might have come from and the obsidian yeah. that's allegedly been found at the at Poverty Point. Uh, if that is, in fact, obsidian, he's got it coming from uh, Idaho, yeah. which is the Gulf of Mexico like not an easier route to get obsidian yeah. to poverty point? <laughs> I, I always looked yeah. at that map with like an arched eyebrow. Like, like uh, I, I love Dave's work, but that like particular yeah. detail always stuck out to me is like, you went to Idaho for obsidian instead of like right down the Gulf of Mexico? Yeah. Yeah, no, you're, and you're right. That's, that's what we're saying here, right? You know, it's not that we preclude those things from happening. But it's a, I think that's a separate conversation uh, than the conversation center around like was Poverty Point inspired by Mesoamerican like temples and stuff like that. I think those are two separate conversations. And I agree with you. Yeah, we have to be open to um, those those places being why would they not be going there? You know, in that instance for obsidian or, you know, other reasons. Or just like maintaining or developing, establishing and maintaining relationships with these people like, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. Far afield. Um, see, like we, we haven't even gotten into the whole thing of like the soapstone exchange network thing that's going on at Poverty Point um, and just how far afield these materials are coming from, which also like I haven't re I haven't had too much time to marinate on this. Uh, but the, the fact that like this whole idea of these people down in the. Uh, lower Mississippi Valley that if you're right and these are acts of of performance in order to maintain or impact you know the world the river whatever it, it should happen to be how do people from Appalachian South Carolina get involved like how, like yeah. what what's the connection there yeah yeah you bring up a great point that I'm glad you brought this up because I touch on this in my in some of my my work uh around poverty point in Jaytown is that we so yeah for your listeners a lot of stuff a lot of stone that is not from Louisiana and it's from all over the place all over the US uh especially the eastern US is found at poverty point traditionally that has been called a trade system right um, Which I call bullshit on because it's not going yeah, yeah. in the opposite direction. Like I've talked about this out before, but just to summarize, it's not going in the opposite direction. It's not like we've got Actually. Galena from St. Louis coming to Poverty Point and then going back to Appalachia. We don't have soapstone from Appalachia coming to Poverty Point and going back up the Mississippi River up to St. Louis. Everything's coming in and nothing leaves except maybe it's the like people goes in a few other. Yeah, exactly. So let me ask you this, Nate. So. Rather than calling it trade, like we've like traditionally it's been called, and apparently this is on your radar, and I love yeah. it <laughs> uh, because I, I beat that drum just as hard. It's not trade, right? Yeah. Uh, what does that sound like? One directional. I think that's 
communities from all over the place they're converging at poverty point yeah like also, when you think about that too why is it that the entire material culture suite, you know, the entire assemblage of, of material culture found at Poverty Point is not replicated in full anywhere else? That's, no. all, that's the place you find it. So I think it's the contributions, the material contributions of multiple distinct, you know, groups that are converging and making, creating a unique material signature at Poverty Point. I, I've, I've. I can't be the only person who makes this analogy, but I compare it to like to like Burning Man or other like major music and arts festivals. People are coming here to be a part of the thing that's going on there. Yeah. Um, yeah. They it's like I say, it's it's metropolitan. It's people who don't necessarily see each other as part of the same group, except for the fact that they're all at poverty point when, you know, the solar alignments are happening and that festival is going on or, or, or what have you. It's, it is a convergence at poverty point for the sake of poverty point, not for the sake of, you know, uh, material exchange networks or, or any of these other kinds of things. Yeah, and I think that the, I think the the origin of that kind of thinking of uh, how, of ways to explain poverty point goes back to this um, conversation we were having earlier about the importance of what theory you are using to interpret your data your data because I would argue that those uh, economically em you know emphasis on economy and trade. Uh, in kind of a market economy, right, comes from an over-reliance and kind of uncritical use of Western-derived social theory um, that's kind of oftentimes uncritically projected back into the past, and not only far into the past, but also into totally different social contexts where other things may be more important, right, than the economy and things like that. And it's not to make this argument that Native people anywhere in time and place, right, or time and space were fundamentally different like that like biological imperatives are biological imperatives right yeah. people need to they have, have the a, voice a, yeah exactly all of those things being said right obviously they apply to native people through all times just as much as they do any other non-indigenous group or whatever but the point is is that i think we've ex over relied on those uh socio-technic you know materialist explanations for explaining like uh, some of the most elaborate cultural expressions of the archaic period, like Poverty Point, we've over explained them as, you know, being the catalyst, the true catalyst, cap, uh, uh, catalyst being economy, trade, uh, and environmental adaptation. All of those things are have a place in explaining history, but I think we've we've kind of really wrung out the mundane explanations of places like Poverty Point, and it doesn't make sense. So where does that leave us? I think it does leave us within the realm of of um ritual i know that we laugh as archaeologists we get cynical about over reliance on ritual as a vague explanation we don't even like have that, to that's where it leaves us you know we don't we don't even have to call it ritual i would i i would like talk about it in terms of like social capital like yeah, this, yeah. like it doesn't have to be like i mean i think there was a religious component for sure but like yeah we don't have to throw the R word at it in order to explain <laughs> it away. Like yeah, yeah. It, we can be a lot more specific about like the uh, think of think about like, you know, pilgrimages to Mecca and the kind of, or, or in the kind of like uh, social capital that, that comes along with that. Like the, these kinds of pilgrimages confer upon someone a, a both lived experience and a certain like added social status oh yeah 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 and um you know like uh we just we've also you know in addition to those sorts of considerations which you're absolutely right we just i think we haven't given enough emphasis on the ways that again those was really broadly defined aspects of native worldviews as they're articulated today like that we can be reasonable in our uh, in our assumptions that People 3,000 years ago generally and vaguely would have thought of similar things like the importance of uh, relationships and the power of performative acts, right? That we've given, we haven't given enough attention to those types of aspects of worldviews, right? Um, and we've kind of projected our own uh, into the past. Uh, again, like basically the machinations of like market economies with like an overemphasis on poverty point was just a big trade hub, things like that. And I think. 
I think that's why we're in such a kind of uns unsatisfactory place with our explanations of places like Poverty Point, you know? Yeah. Well, um, I think I, that's that's it for because we actually hit a lot of the beats of the list of questions that I had uh, throughout. Okay. There are only a couple of things. Um, I want to know, like, because the when I first created this channel, the idea was one, get information out of the gray and white literature in front of, you know, people who are not enrolled in college classrooms. But the other was yeah. like, I wish I had a channel like this when oh. I was an undergrad that could like at least put these kinds of things on my radar. Um mm -hmm. Uh, that were you know e more easily digestible and stuff to like you know propel me along and and you know the kinds of things that I might be interested in. Um, is there any like do you have any like suggestions for like material that I I might cover that would be useful since you're teaching undergrads that uh, you know would be helpful um, pedagogical tools? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, well, I mean, one uh, you know like. Your channel is a really powerful tool, and I and I I, I uh, assign uh, certain you know videos and stuff for these exact reasons. And I'm not just trying to uh, puff your <laughs> puff your chest up because I'm a, uh, because I've, you, I've been lucky enough to uh, be a guest today. But you know, channel channels like yours that are uh, you know um, geared towards a popular audience and it's in, a, in an accessible way, but are still empirically accurate and rigorous like in your discussion and i think that's awesome so you're doing great work uh i you know i'm i'm kind of blanking on other sources uh but i have them you know what i mean i and i would actually be happy to look at kind of my syllabi and and kind of uh pick a few things and give them back to you you can maybe put it in a link mm -hmm. um that sounds like a good idea uh yeah okay great yeah well, cool. Uh, we've been going for like an hour and a half now, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. Is there anything else that like you you want to talk about that we didn't get to? Uh, you know, I would leave your listeners with one uh, kind of final, you know, some food for thought. We we talk about like you know um, the R word or right? ritual and like and these different approaches, these alternative explanations of places like Poverty Point. Um, I want to emphasize, and, and people, the, the folks who like read the dissertation and all that, like professional, other professionals, we're kind of that's a minority. So I think that these things need to be, yeah, like your your channel is a great you know um, venue for explaining these kinds of things. I in no way want to make archaeology less empirically rigorous, right? Uh, when we talk about like performance and things like that. Um, and what I would say, and I, my research has, you know, demonstrated this, we can use, you know, modern analytical methods like statistical modeling, right, for radiocarbon dates. Um, with In the realm of geoarchaeology, we've used micromorphology, right, looking at dirt under a microscope, essentially. And we can access, I believe, we can access the material correlates of performance in the archaeological record. It is not as intangible is maybe it once was, right, 50 years ago. For example, at Jaytown, through micromorphology, we can look at instances of trampling, right, on, uh, on ground surfaces before mounds were built. Um, we can see how fires for feast were put out with water uh, because of the micromorph signatures of uh, dusty coatings on clay nodules, uh, indicative of, of fires being extinguished with water. Uh, we can look at these instances of performance at an incredible individual human scale, and we can document them in the lab, and we can do this empirically, and we can access things like performance in a material way, right? So we're not just, you know, pie in the sky, you know, uh, pontificating <laughs> on on ritual, right? In a in a vague sense, we can document performance in the archaeological record. We have you know the theoretical creativity to do so, and our methodological rigor to make those you know valid interpretations. And so, I think we're just at a place where we can we can create and we can contribute more. Uh, you know, creative and, and accurate depictions of ancient human, human creativity and capacity for building incredible places like Poverty Point. And we can do it without relying, overly relying on kind of uh, 
more mundane and more importantly, empirically invalid, you know, ideas like, well, tra it's a trade hub. Yeah. You know, like we're, we're getting to a point where I think archaeology can contribute some really cool things to our understanding of the ancient human past, and we can do it with rigor. And and just to like elaborate on that, we we very seldom go directly to those kinds of uh, explanations. It's usually after the materialist explanations have failed that yeah. we, that we start to have to entertain these other ideas because the materialist explanations don't work. The patterns yeah. are wrong, um, yeah. or, or or these other things. So, um, yeah, uh, thank you so much for um, you know taking taking time out of your your weekend to talk to me about all this stuff. Um, uh, I I would like to uh, have you back on again later to talk about uh, you know more more archaic like more archaic stuff. Um, yeah, like. Poverty Point is the, is the site that kept me in North America. Uh, I I thought I was going to be an Indo-European researcher, and I was going to you know go oh. off on the you know Jim Mallory David Anthony uh, thing before actually Ken Sassman gave a presentation on Poverty Point, and I'm like, okay, screw all that, I'm staying here. <laughs> um, Sassman's awesome. <laughs> the uh, the um, Eastern Archaic Historicized is like still that book changed everything uh hey, for, for me for, too. for me at least like it just opened it opened up so many doors and made the uh my friend dan Polito said it's like he made the archaic sexy again like it's just yeah, it's oh, yeah. such a rich <laughs> uh rich and subversive time period for re rejecting like so many like uh, unilineal progressivist yep. models and it just like it's screaming from the ground the way you've been taught life works is wrong exactly <laughs> i couldn't agree more and you know that's what honestly that was a uh, the eastern archaic historicized by ken that was actually one of the books that really like lit my brain on fire and ultimately among other things and other influences obviously right um, set me on the path that I'm on now. And that's really ultimately, if you think about it, what I'm doing, I'm trying to historicize. Yeah. Point, no? Well, cool. Um, I, I will, I will let you go. I always have to like, say, I'm going to let people go like four times before I actually do that's okay. it. But, <laughs> but uh, that's okay. I, thank you so much for having me. It's really my pleasure to uh, spend some time here. I've been, I've been aware of your channel and watched it for years now. And, you know, I've me, uh, you and I kind of, uh, catch up at conferences here and there. So I'm glad we finally, I finally got to, uh, to be a guest. So thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been cool. Talk to you later. All right. See you, Nate.